we're back, everybody. It's time to meet our community, the Hispanic business community here in Orange County. Powered by the Orange County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and Orange County's only community radio station, OC Talk Radio. Streaming live from our studios here at the University of California, Irvine's Beale Applied Innovation Center is the man, well, I'll let you judge for yourself today uh, who he brought along. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Yes, uh, definitely uh, we'll judge today how our show goes. We have a special guest with us. Welcome, everybody, to our community podcast show powered by the Orange County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I'm your host, John Gutierrez, Senior Vice President here at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We have a special guest with us today. Her name is Michelle Bell. She is a Superior Court Commissioner, daughter of a Panamanian immigrant. Viva Panama. (laughs) <laughs> a mentor of Latinx law students, and uh, she's definitely a community leader, and we're going to learn more about her and what she's got going on. Thank you for being here, um, Your Honor, Ms. Bell. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Hispanic uh, Chamber of Commerce. Yes. So first and foremost, thank you, Myrna Velasquez, who's also joining us here on the side. Uh, I know you guys are all good friends, right? And uh, and I really appreciate you uh, bringing her out here and you guys collaborate a lot in the community, right? Yes. Um, Orange County is a community that's near and dear to my heart. I live here. I'm raising my two boys here with my husband and um, community is key. Yes. Yes. Myrna and I actually go way back since third grade since we were kids. So we won't tell any of those stories. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll keep those out. But as everybody knows that tunes into our show, uh, one of the things we like to do is, is get to know you as a person. We'll go into everything you've been doing in the community and what you got going on. But we like to get to know you um, as far as where you grew up. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, if you wish, and then how you got to this, this position you're in now in life. Absolutely. So I grew up in Southern California. I'm a daughter of biracial parents. My father's from Panama. He immigrated to New York um, in the early 60s and met my mom. She's first generation Italian American and they built a life here in Southern California. So I grew up here, really strong family ties. Um, And I grew up at a time where there weren't people that looked like me. So it was interesting because you know, my family blended cultures yes, and it was just so character building to um, experience that and experience acceptance within our families, but then also just the community that my parents built here in California. So my mom, especially very strong Italian Catholic background, and we just built that here when we grew up. And so my family was very involved in the church. It was really about building a community. So, you know, singing in the choir and <laughs> doing all of these events uh, that the church would host, you know, and I went to the school it was really a big part of my background. My but sister you must and I. have had you must have had some good uh, dinners. I mean, you're talking <laughs> Panama food, <laughs> Italian food. I mean, what is that like? Absolutely. Because <laughs> here at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, we're always talking food, right? Because in the Hispanic community, it is about music, art. And comida, right? <laughs> so I can just imagine those dinners at your at your mom's and your dad's. And Platanos th- at every table, I mean, must have. Really? But absolutely, yes. Okay, okay. So yes. your neighbors love probably the kids <laughs> in the neighborhood, huh? Some good dinners there. Good food, always, and good company. You grew up in uh, Chino Hills or I, something? I did. Ontario? I grew up in Chino. Chino Hills didn't exist when I grew up, okay. um, but became a city. So I did. I grew up in Ontario, then we moved to Chino. Um, I went to school, Pomona Catholic, uh, and then went to Cal Poly Pomona for undergrad and then got my law degree at Tulane Law in New Orleans. So, Good for you. Wow. Yeah. I will say Chino Hills, when I was growing up as a kid, my parents, my dad loved to go down there, visit the cows and get fresh milk. <laughs> it's interesting now because I talk about that with our kids and, and, you know, we used to love going down there with my parents and it was such a cool experience, you know? Was that like growing up there, the, the whole uh, back then, the cows. Uh, there were still a lot of dairy farms, yes. and they've developed the area so much. So yes. a lot of the farms left, unfortunately, because of economic challenges. Yes, but yes. Um, no, it was a great, great experience to to grow up in that area. Definitely, a sense of community. So, um, so Tulane. What made you pick Tulane for school? How did that happen? 
You know, I just really wanted to have that college experience on campus. And New Orleans is the largest small city you can find. Really? It has such history and culture and a blending of cultures, which I think once you go there and you see the history of the buildings, architecture, and meet all the different people there that live there, you just love it. You fall in love. Such a different experience than like Chino Hills, Ontario area. Completely. Was that culture shocking for you a little bit? Was it, it an adjustment? Was. No, it really was. Um, and I think a lot of it was because there was this lack of Latinos at the time I went. Okay. You know, um, and the food was different as well, but it wasn't the melting pot that we experience here in Southern California. When you're brought out of it, you really realize how much you miss it. Yes. Um, so and it I'm was And I'm glad you shock. said Southern California because I went to school in Northern California and I, and it is California still, but even Northern California is very different than Southern California. And so to your point, it's so true. We're so used to that melting pot, so many cultures. And when you go somewhere else, it's not always that, that way. Absolutely. But I loved the experience. It was great for me and in, in my career. Um, but then I came back to, to Southern California and started working in Orange County as a lawyer. So, okay. And you were under civil litigation, is that? I was doing complex civil litigation. Uh-huh. So I was doing cases like that. But I think, you know, after working in that field, it just didn't feel right. You know, that that community, the public service background that I, I had growing up just wasn't there in my career. And so I looked to work um, for the government, and I wound up at the Orange County Public Defender's Office. Wow. Yes. How different is that than what you were doing before? So different, because when I would show up to court proceedings as a complex civil litigator, it would just be lawyers. It would be anywhere from 10 to 30 lawyers because it'd be a large development project where there were suits between the general contractor and subcontractors, but you know, in criminal law, it's very much a people's court. You know, the hallways are filled of families and children, um, and you're running from one courtroom to the next because you have so many cases. Yes. So. so let me ask you this. As a Hispanic female, did you find it was challenging? I mean, it was just not very many women. Uh, for our listeners, we have a lot of our youth chamber that listens to our show. I mean, Tell us a little bit about that challenge. Absolutely. When I started practicing and when I was working, especially uh, as a public defender, many times people would approach me thinking I was the interpreter. Really? Yes. Wow. Um, You know, or clients would be surprised that I would be their counsel. Okay. Um, And it's just something that you have to work through because I think once they see you in, in, in motion, they gain the trust and confidence that they need to know that you can do the job. But, you know, I think that slowly our courts are changing. I think now we have more women in the legal field. You know, at the time I went to law school, it was 50-50. But even on the bench now, because I'm a commissioner, we're still not half female, half male. You know, the the demographic still is, is lower for women. And so it's still an industry that's developing over time, especially with minority populations. So, you know, there aren't very many black or Hispanic bench officers in Orange County. And I know I'm the first Afro-Latinx bench officer in Orange County, which is... Good for you. Really amazing. Yes. Yes. That must mean a lot to your parents, your family, the community. How has that been for you, the reaction of them seeing you in this growth? And, And not only that, but your husband and your family too, right? It's very touching and makes me emotional at times, you know, and I think... I know where I'm from. My family has always been supportive and proud, and it's amazing. But when I'm in court and I see the reaction of the people, I think that that makes the most impact on me. Why is that? Because it's humbling. Because they see me and they're at ease. Okay. They see somebody they can connect with. They see someone that looks like them. Yes. And they're not used to that. I think it's something that's shifting, right? I I think our courts and I think our society is just more inclusive now. Yes. And that's a word that is only just now being used more recently, but it's so important because there's room for all of us. Mm-hmm. And I think collectively, the more people that you have in any sort of industry, profession, you know, government agency, the better everything is because you have such a diversity of perspective. Well, let's be real. Courts are pretty scary. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? And I know growing up in Santa Ana myself, when I went to college, culture shocking to see no Latinos in the classrooms. And so when I came back home, 
it was very interesting to be again in that melting pot you talked about earlier. And so certain people like our teachers, our professors, our police officers, they're of a certain color we're used to, right? And so to see a teacher who's Hispanic, a police officer maybe that's Hispanic, right? Someone in the courts, a judge, whatever it may be, it's, I know when I became a third grade teacher coming out of college, it was like I stood out like a sore thumb because it's all females and very few Hispanic males. Right. So it was culture shocking for the community to see Mr. G, which is what they called me, Mr. Gutierrez. You must be going through that, right, in this whole process, uh, being kind of like, I have to earn my way in or the stripes. Absolutely. And I do experience that. You know, I think it still surprises people sometimes, you know, seeing me walk down the hall even my age, you know, I'm going to be 45 on Sunday, but, um, you know, just having someone, happy who's, birthday. Thank you. <laughs> having someone who's, who's younger and a bench officer yes. is, is surprising. So I try and take that in when I interact with people, because I know it does, it takes time, I think, to reimagine. And this expression that if you can see it, you can be it is so true. You know, I think that there's a lot of imposter syndrome that we have in our communities. Um, you know, as a woman of color, I've asked myself throughout my career, can I do this? And I don't know that other people ask that as often, but I think that it's something where if you can see someone doing a job and doing it well and they look like you, it's so motivating. But why is a question. Why do it? Why do it? Why put yourself through that? That's really the, the motivation, right? Like, why? what is the why? It's so important to our community. It's so important to have that diversity of perspective. You know, I, I come from an immigrant family. I come from someone who's learning English as a second language. I come from working with people in a very vulnerable time in their life where they are in despair a lot of times as a former public defender. And I also have a background in working with people who don't have educational background to really understand where they're at, you know, in in a moment. And I think it kind of helps our courts move forward with the administration of justice, because when you have someone like me who you're appearing in front of, if something's not right, I pick up on that because of the diversity of experience I've had and where I'm from. Mm. And I think it just makes it better. You mentioned before we started the show that you enjoy mentoring. I do. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. Like, you enjoy mentoring students in the community. Where did that come from? I don't know where it came from. All I know is it gives me energy. You know, it it gives me this excitement to see someone at the beginning of their career that doesn't necessarily know what they want to do or, or where they want to be. And my ability to help them or kind of help guide them, connect them with others, it just makes me happy, you know, because I think that when I was going through that, there were people that helped me along the way. And there's this, um, there's a difference, I think, these days between mentors, mentorship and sponsorship. You know, we not only need mentors, we need people that are really going to introduce us and help us get from point A to point B because. Exactly. (sighs) That's, that's, that's what we do at the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce with our youth chamber. Yes. It's not just mentoring them. It's inviting them to our events, networking, introducing them to people. That's such a key uh, component of helping them grow in their career, right? Building bridges is Mm -hmm. key. So I really just have such a a love of working with youth. Um, And when I was a lawyer especially, I was very involved in the Thurgood Marshall Bar Association and the Orange County Hispanic Bar Association and the Orange County Bar Association developing programs. Um, and networking opportunities for law students because when you make those connections, they really help move your career forward. Yes. And I don't think our youth understands that because they're so focused on other things. What is your goal in the next five, 10 years? What do you want to see in the industry you're in? Hopefully change or evolve. What would you, if you had that magic wand, what would that be? That's a great question. I mean, I'm with our courts. And so it's not an industry so much as it is a branch of government. And I think just continuing to be available as a community figure, I think people need to know who our our judges and commissioners are. I think that... Do you feel people don't? No? I don't think they really do. Like they're there, but just the community doesn't know who they are. I think the legal community yeah. knows who they are, but I don't know if the greater community knows who yeah. they are. Don't get me wrong. I mean, 
being on the bench is a very um, sacred, right? Yes, but it's a it's just a very full job. There's so much that you have to do just to make sure that your calendar and your courtroom runs smoothly. There's just a lot of work associated with it. So I'm not saying that that uh, that's a reason why people aren't maybe out in the community as much, but I think it's important to have more of a presence in our community so people know who are making decisions for them. Yeah, I think it's intriguing that here you are, you've done all this in your life, in your community, and people like like yourselves that are leaders in the community are not recognized walking down the street as opposed to like a big social media Don't get me influencer. wrong. I don't want to be recognized <laughs> down the street. I don't. You know, is that, is that not a good thing? Is that, well, is I, that don't, a bad I guess thing? it depends on if they're happy with their case resolution or not. I don't know. <laughs> that, I guess that's true. Ha, has that happened? Has it been scary situations? I mean, um, you know, that is a component. So there is a There's judicial a protection yes. unit that's established for our courts for a reason, you know, and, yeah. and, um, I am a mom, and, and there, and I am in the criminal division. So, but I no, I've never personally had an experience. So, um. knock on wood. That's <laughs> that's good to know. I, I mean, it's interesting because you and I talked about this before the show. Is who wakes up and says, "Yeah, I want to grow up and be in the court systems, be a judge one day, be a commission, whatever it is." That's that's. I mean, most people will say, "I want to be a doctor, an attorney," right? Which is congratulations, right? Kudos. But then you're taking it to another level now, right? And uh, that that takes a lot of uh, a lot of risk, right? Like you said, as a mom, as a wife, as a family person, there's a lot of challenges. I have a friend who became an FBI agent right at college, and I remember he said to me, "We can't be roommates no more because I have to pursue this career, and I put you at risk." And I was like, "Whoa, really?" And he's one of my fraternity brothers, wow. you know, and we're pretty tight, you know. We're, and so he says, "I can't, you know, this is the path I need to." like follow now and i haven't seen him and talked to him in, in person in a while i you know we chat here and there but his his life is so private right right and so to your point earlier you kind of do but don't want to be recognized when you're out and about it's true i think it's important to be involved in the community in which you live and serve but i don't think to the extent that you're you know celebrity status by any means i i don't think that's necessary but i think it definitely helps uh, promote confidence in the court when you're out and you meet someone and they realize what you do and who you are because maybe when they walk into the courthouse if they need to for any reason it'll be a little bit less scary what kind of legacy you want to leave behind when the career is over that i was someone who listened that i was fair and that i was someone who encouraged other people to be more involved and, and give back so Paul here, our producer, wants to know, what is a commissioner? We should share that with our audience because it's, it's important. We help people understand what is a commissioner. Can you share that with us? Absolutely. When you apply to be a Superior Court Commissioner, you fill out the same application that you would for the governor to be appointed to be a judge. Okay. And um, it's very extensive. It goes through your whole career, references, serious cases that you've tried, just all of your credentials. And so... Judges have an executive committee at the Orange County Superior Court, and judge on the executive executive committee represents a band of judges. So all judges are represented on this executive committee. Wow. They vet the applications. Um, it's a huge recruitment. It's very competitive. Very competitive. Um, calls are made out to the community, to other lawyers, um, to other judges, and then they rank people decide who they want to uh, sit for interviews and then go through a formal interview process. And let me tell you, I have never been at such an intimidating interview as a room of 25 judges who, some of whom I've met and appeared in front of and others who I have not, but. I can imagine, because this morning my wife and I were talking, I said, this is kind of different, me interviewing somebody in this platform, right. in this area, because, you know, we like I said, we have different community leaders we have members of our chamber but it's just what you all do is very i guess you could say kind of private uh very high standards and to become an attorney is hard enough much less all these other titles are very very tough so i can imagine how intimidating that is it know? was it was intimidating but it definitely gave me confidence um in the sense that i've had the career that i've had because like i said many of the the judges that appointed me knew me they knew my work i had appeared in front of them over the course of 
almost 15 years, you build a reputation in the legal community, especially in the courts when you appear in front of people. And so it meant a lot that those people that knew me thought I could do the job and serve. And so commissioners are really no different from judges. The only difference is people have to agree to go to my courtroom. So there's a stipulation that they'll submit to uh, me hearing their case. And so it can be limiting in the sense that if it's a contentious proceeding in a lot of family law cases or dependency cases, even juvenile cases, they don't have commissioners because parties already are at odds in, in what's happening in court. And so being a judge is a little bit different in that regard. But right now I'm in the criminal division. In the 15 months I've been over at the court, I've heard a variety of matters. I've called mental health calendars, the parole calendar for the county that's centralized. Today, after our podcast, I'm going to our jail arraignment court, and it's a centralized court for all the arrests wow. that occur in the county. So I sit bail on cases like that. I've also done a open jury trial assignment, so I've uh, conducted misdemeanor jury trials and felony hearings. And we are just at a, a critical juncture, I think, at the court because of COVID. We've lost a lot of bench officers, a lot retired in the last few years. And so we are understaffed, which has been a good opportunity for me from an experience standpoint. But it's very busy. You mentioned mental health. And I know that is a huge topic right now everywhere. And I know you mentioned earlier um, we were talking about how you've dealt with a lot of situations with like the homeless community. Right. What is that like? I mean, in, can you share a little bit about what you guys are seeing out there, how you guys are handling those situations? I think one of the best examples I could provide is at one point when I was at the public defender's office, I was assigned to a probate court assignment for the mentally ill. So if you had been incarcerated or hospitalized due to your mental health within a short period of time, um, county council would activate a petition, basically um, putting you in the civil court, this probate court, and you would be monitored by a bench officer, a judge. Um, You'd have a public defender assigned. There would be county council, healthcare agency, and doctors. Wow, like a whole team. It it was, because it's a collaborative court. So we want to help get someone back on track. They're being hospitalized because they're not on their medication. They don't have access to services. And so at that time, I was going out with my paralegal literally to homeless shelters, to lockdown wards of the mental hospitals, to room and board, sober living homes all over the county, even for my homeless clients, the corner of First and Main. Wow. Right? And so we would try and engage them with services and really meet their families and try and do what we could to get them on board with treatment and services. It's a challenge. I think a lot of our criminal system is tied to mental health and addiction related issues Mm -hmm. um, and homelessness feeds into that. So there have been um, many pushes towards more collaborative courts in Orange County, which is I think amazing. There is definitely a push for more funding through healthcare agency and probation for rehabilitative services. That's great. That's great. So we are we are doing the work. Working hard towards a, a better direction. Towards a, a goal of rehabilitation. Yes. If if it's something that is feasible. Wow. Well, listen, homeless, uh, mental health. These are topics that are probably not going to go away for a long time. But as long as we continue to support as many uh, services in the community. Uh, We definitely applaud everything you're doing. Thank you. Um, I know the show goes by really quick, and we shared a lot about, obviously, your family, your upbringing. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Folks, please uh, be on the lookout for Michelle Bell, who's Superior Court Commissioner. Uh, She is out there in our community as a leader. Any way they can, like, connect with you or just reach you what, what do you i mean i don't know you guys don't do social media as commissioners so just be on the lookout right <laughs> um some bench officers do have social media okay. i'm one of them okay okay that's good um, to know yes so i'm bell for judge b-e-l-l-f-o-r-j-u-d-g-e and that's instagram or that's facebook that's instagram okay and you can find me on facebook as oh, well oh great yeah great i think it'd be great for the community to if any of you have any questions or concerns definitely reach out to you and see how we can uh, 
you know, answer those questions, right? And I'm a resource for um, anyone on the bench to come out and speak to young groups. Any classroom visits or uh, law schools, please feel free to call my clerk, occourts.org. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Folks, well, there you have it. Um, definitely keep an eye out for Michelle Bell, who's uh, he's, she's doing some great things in the community. We want to thank for being on our show. Um, we also want to thank Myrna Velasquez, thank you for being here. She is with Velasquez Consulting Company. You can also reach her at 714-661-6082. Thank you for being a member of our chamber. I know you go way back with me since we were kids and with John Amador, our our former chairman of our board. Um, And I know you do a lot in the community, Myrna, so thank you so much for all you do. Um, And then also, thank you to all our listeners. Please continue to support us, uh, our Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Facebook page, and of course our Instagram at OCHCC.com or our Instagram, OCHCC. And then stay tuned for our toy drive, December 15th. If you're interested in being a part of it, let us know. It's our annual toy drive, which, of course, we put together about 1,000 toys for local community shelters, the Boys and Girls Club, the Delhi Center, TKO Boxing, you name it. And this year, we're also uh, bringing in Chalk Hospital, the Latino Advisory Board. And so it's going to be a great event. December 15th, you're welcome to come. Thank you. Uh, and be a part of it. And thank you for being on the show with thank us today. Thank you for having me. All right, Paul, take it away. <laughs> Well, there you have it. Another great reason to tune in each and every time to meet our community, the Hispanic business community here in Orange County. Powered by the Orange County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and Orange County's only community radio station, OC Talk Radio. Streaming live from our studios here at the University of California, Irvine's Beal Applied Innovation Center. 